we're not going to be sitting all the time in order for us to practice. Sometimes I notice students, practitioners have this misconception that in order for us to be practicing, we need to be sitting and sitting long. And yes, there are many um, teachers out there who promote such ideas. Of course, no one can undermine the value of sitting as such. Sitting still, that's necessary for the practice. However, to limit the scope of the practice just within the confines of the sit itself is wrong view. Lord Buddha started with sati when he listed whether it's the five spiritual faculties, the five spiritual powers. Of course, we talked extensively about the um, satta bojangas or sambojangas, the seven factors of awakening, starting with sati. Often we forget that the crucial element, the one thing that must be there in the practice, whether you're sitting or not, is the maintenance of sati. Maintenance of sati. Because sati is the thing which is going to point the finger at what it is that the attention is upon where it is kept, the attention. In that sense, sati is the thing which is going to allow us to see whether the attention itself is yoniso manasikara or ayoniso manasikara. Is it wise reflection or is it unwise reflection or attention? Because you could be sitting for 12 hours straight. And you could be the dumbest person on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. Because you're just allowing just a state of passivity happen. So sati allows you, allows us to own our awareness, if you will. To own our position, the alertness. That's why the word alert says a lot. You're alert. It's like a snake handler, a poisonous snake handler. And the mind is more powerful than any snake out there. The moment we l relinquish, let go, or we handle the snake in a wrong fashion, meaning we reach for the tail instead of the head to hold it. For that we have the alagaddu pomasutta, a simile of the water snake, where Lord Buddha says, you do not hold the snake from its tail, such a venomous snake, otherwise you will die. Well, the mind is that powerful, and I often see many people making excuses that, Bhante, I can't sit for more than one hour or I can't sit for extended periods of time. Okay. I'm not saying that's okay. <laughs> what I'm saying is it's necessary for you to nevertheless do the rest of the work, meaning what happens between the sits. Where is sati? That's why it's, it's a sad uh, um, <laughs> phenomenon to go on retreats. And once the retreat is over, everybody just goes, oh, now I can go back to my normal life. 
I just relinquished it. That ruined everything as far as I'm concerned. Because the sitting is done so that we can actually get to the right elevation, if you will. It's like with a passenger plane reaching that cruising altitude over, over 10,000 meters or 34,000 feet. But once it's there, it habituates the mind. It allows the mind to feel comfortable with maintaining of sati. So it's the trigger in a sense. So once the sitting is done, like today's sitting, two hours, you sat for two hours. So once today's sitting is done, it behooves upon you to make sure that you are maintaining sati from this point till your next sit. That's what's going to get us closer to liberation, not the sit itself. Rarely have I come across uh, suttas um, in, in the Nikayas where it was purely because the person was sitting and it happened in it. Yeah, it does happen. But most of the time, awakening happens in between those stages, in the normal hours. When you're doing your thing, when you're washing your dishes, when you're going to the bathroom, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're writing something that you think very, is very important, and all of a sudden you catch yourself, are there any defilements there? And if it's a, one of those beautiful moments where you find that gap, oh my, I don't have any thoughts, and I'm okay. I'm okay. Because sati is the thing which is going to tell us that the mind is occupied with sannyas. And that is the problem. Sannyas have dominated our lives. The memories, perceptions, concoctions, mental. So I'm going to try to minimize today's uh, Dhamma talk. Um, <laughs> Because, as you can tell, my voice um, is not so well. Um, I have the cold. Um, so, I got tested, nothing serious. So, just normal cold, apparently. Who knew? That still happens, apparently. Um, so, but I wanted to give you enough encouragement to bring the attention back to the times where you're not doing proper meditation, the sitting, because many people have been promoting that. Sit, sit, sit longer, sit longer. Well, a rock sits better than anybody. It's been, you know, some rocks they've discovered in Canada that have been there for a couple of billion years. No sati, no panya. Sati is the thing which will transform itself into Dhamma Vichaya, which is the second of the seven factors of awakening. Sati is the thing which reveals the mental objects. That's what Dhamma Vichayas are all about, basically, investigation of the different phenomena, mental phenomena that are occurring constantly. Now, the moment you have that, the moment you're able to penetrate, to see what the mind is doing, what it is holding on to, and not without sati, only because of sati, the moment you do that, the mind awakens. then you see that it is more than just what we presumed, what we hoped the practice would be, should be, could be. So I want to, today's emphasis, albeit a very short talk, um, 
I want the emphasis to be on sati. <coughs> for you to bring the attention and awareness back to it. And please do not undermine its significance. Oh, it's just sati. It's just mindfulness, you know. No, it's, it's everything. If we have sati, we have everything else. If we're doing it right. So, breaking the bonds of ignorance of our expectations. Meaning, these are the steps that I have to practice first before I get to some level of awakening. Putting that aside, that type of mentality, putting that aside and just focusing on, can I stay with my object? Today's sit, I began by encouraging you with the words, um, I think I was saying, stay with it. Stay with it. Can you stay with it? Sati is all about staying with it, despite what the situations or the circumstances might dictate or force you to be doing. Just stay with it. And if you break that point of contact with Sati, that's okay. Recapture it. Use the body. Venerable Anuruddha was asked after he became awakened, he became an arahant. Nearly every single time he was asked by bhikkhus, Bhante, what method did you use to become an arahant? He would always, always insist on the satipatthana. He would say, I've been using the satipatthana. That is how I became an arahant. I've been applying the satipatthana. That is how I became an arahant. That is how the asavas were destroyed. When you are practicing sati, you are practicing the satipatthana. So long as you're following the various phases of the body. Yes, the Lord Buddha talked about four. Sitting, standing, walking, and laying down. Okay, but there's other states of physical postures, you know. We all know those. The junction points, as Bhantanyananda would say. But in addition to those, we have the feelings. Observing the feelings that arise. What is the nature of this particular feeling? Oop, there's another feeling. Well, sati is the thing which captures that. And the more you're doing this, the more you'll be able to see Dhamma Vichaya coming into view. It's just natural, natural progression of things. So long as one is doing its job, the other one's going to flow out of it. And the same goes with the mind. You see how the mind is settled or agitated, restless, perhaps. And then you can see how impermanence comes in. You see the hindrances. You see the five factors, uh, um, the, the, the five aggregates. You see all these things. And then you're doing the Dhamma Anupasana. So our hands are, in a sense, full. Sometimes we think that we don't have enough with just sati. What is that? I need to know more, Bhante. I need to know. No, you have enough. You have more than enough. The late Webu Sayadaw, one of the greatest arahants of the 20th century, used to say, use one object. Stick to it. But the problem is we don't. We like to, you know, switch constantly. We like, we like variety. He would have this beautiful analogy. He would encourage his students. You know, uh, there's a city in uh, Myanmar or Burma called, called Mandalay. So 
he would use the example of the train ride to Mandalay, which is somewhat far from where he used to live. And he rarely left his kuti, his, his, uh, his hometown for the biggest chunk of his life. It was only later in his life when he was invited. But anyhow, the point that he was um, saying, making is this. He says, imagine you bought a ticket to Mandalay. Mandalay. The train is going to make many, many stops until it reaches Mandalay. Do not leave the train until you reach your final stop, your final destination. That is Mandalay. And the Mandalay here, of course, is a simile for full Nibbana. He was one of the most adamant teachers, beautifully anchored in the Sangvega, the urgency, keeping the Dhamma alive in the 20th century and now the 21st century. He would say, when you get tired, when you get bored, do not leave your seat. <laughs> seat as in, don't exit the train. When you get sorrowful, when you get worried, when you get restless, don't exit the train. When things are going so smoothly and beautifully, don't exit the train. Stay. Your ticket is supposed to take you to Mandalay, not anywhere else. And when you're confused, like, oh, have we reached it yet? Did I pass it yet? No, the final destination is Mandalay. Final awakening, full awakening, Nibbana. Don't exit the train until you have reached it. And that is what I'd like to leave you with today. Don't exit the train until you've reached, until you've reached your destination. Only you can make sure of that. A teacher is only here as a tool, that's it. As an encouragement here and there. The teacher is never to, supposed to be a crutch, never supposed to constantly be pushing you, although we try. <laughs> but ultimately the best comes from you, the best effort. The willingness to stay in your seat, uh, in, the, in your train, in your wagon, without leaving it until you make sure that, okay, until they come and throw you out of the train. Don't get out of the train. That is the encouragement that late Venerable Webu Sayadaw gave. And in his case, in case uh, some of you might not know, I haven't mentioned perhaps, um, he got one meditation object from his teacher, from his preceptor, in fact. After he was a, a bhikkhu for, I think, seven years or so. And then he took off to the, into isolation, into his kuti. And he was there for about, I think, four or four and a half years. And his teacher had said, the preceptor, when you hit it, when you reach it, <laughs> come and teach me. And that's what happened. He actually got to Mandalay. He became an Arand. And he never stopped talking about the guarantee that Lord Buddha's Dhamma takes us, allows us to reach the culmination of the Dhamma. So Forget about all these mumbo-jumbo expectations that we have, this and that. Put the energy in you, on your life, in your efforts. Nobody's going to do it for you. If you get sluggish, if you get, you know, drowsy, if you fall like constantly sleeping in your sit, that is one person's fault, yours. It's a fault, so you have to overcome that. You have to push yourself. Imagine you're playing with a venomous snake and you're 
being neglectful and you're just like, I'm sorry, I'm drowsy. And guess what? The snake is going to bite you. So we need to own up. This is our life and we need to stay with it until we reach Mandalay. So those are the encouraging words that I could uh, share with you today. I hope they are of use. And I, again, my apologies, my, uh, my uh, physical conditions are not allowing me to go longer. Um, so I will pause here and I will unfortunately not be able to ask, answer any questions. However, please, uh, if, if you feel you have questions, um, that shouldn't stop you from sending me an email and I will do my very best to get back to you with an appropriate uh, answer as best as I can. So, mm. good. I'm 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 very happy of your efforts to put in, but please bring in your sati in between. That's when all of these things are taking place. Sati, sati, sati. So let us share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Be well, and may the blessings of the Triple Gem be with you always, and your loved ones. Always doing your surgery on the mind by maintaining sati. If you just have that, you're going to get to Mandalay. Be well, I'll see you next week. So, okay, hold it.